In uh, today's briefing, I will um, begin by summarizing and giving context uh, to the Prime Minister's recent engagements. And also there are other briefing points uh, that we can uh, explore. So to begin with um, the official state visit uh, to Nigeria that had been undertaken by the Prime Minister on the 25th of May, um, as you know, Ethiopia and Nigeria have had uh, long-standing um, relations since both uh, countries opened their embassies um, in their respective capitals um, in the 1960s. Uh, since then, there has been several official uh, visits that have been undertaken um, uh, by both countries. And um, after the Prime Minister took office, President Buhari had also um, uh, held an official state visit to Ethiopia. Uh, so, during the stay in Abuja, the two leaders discussed um, bilateral, regional, international issues of mutual concern. And currently, Nigeria and Ethiopia are both working on several areas of uh, bilateral cooperation, which you already may know, uh, particularly in the areas of defense, aviation, science and technology, industry, trade and investment, and a plethora of other um, areas. Hence, um, part of their discussions entailed an agreement um, to enhance uh, the cooperation in these fields, as well as uh, the others that have not been stated. Um, also, the third Ethiopia-Nigeria Joint Ministerial Commission meeting will be held um, within the second uh, week of June uh, this year, um, where several memorandum of understandings are expected to be signed, um, uh, particularly on these areas of cooperation and others. Um, to this end, the two leaders also reiterated their readiness to make the upcoming uh, Joint Ministerial Commission a success. And uh, with these points, it's also important to underscore the domestic disinformation that has been uh, circulating the past week on the intent and of the state visit um, to Nigeria. Following uh, the state visit to Nigeria, the Prime Minister, accompanied with his uh, ministerial delegation, headed to Equatorial Guinea, as you all know as well, uh, to attend the African Union's Extraordinary Humanitarian Summit in Malabo. And considering the environmental and human-induced um, challenges um, that the continent, in particular the Horn region, is um, experiencing, the participation in this uh, summit aimed to highlight the need for concerted effort in addressing uh, humanitarian needs, not only domestically, but also um, uh, regionally and continent-wide. So to this end, uh, the Prime Minister in his remarks um, at the summit emphasized Ethiopia's uh, commendation for the establishment of the African Union Humanitarian Agency, underscoring the need to be guided by the principles of uh, Pan-Africanism and African shared values um, in the constitution or the makeup of the agency. He also briefed uh, the summit um, on actions that Ethiopia has been in particular um, undertaking to address uh, the vast humanitarian needs um, uh, brought on to the country by uh, natural disasters as well as um, uh, conflict. Uh, following uh, the conclusion of participation at the summit, as you all know, there was a visit to the Republic of Kenya. Uh, this last leg of this trip included a short stay in uh, Nairobi, where the Prime Minister conferred with the Kenyan President um, on regional as well as bilateral issues of uh, mutual concern. Towards uh, the end of uh, last week, uh, we know that uh, the Prime Minister had also participated in the Stockholm Plus 50 um, engagement, and uh, virtually the Prime Minister relayed a message during uh, the United Nations Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. Um, it's to be recalled that in May of last year, the United Nations um, General Assembly had adopted a resolution uh, to, bring to, the global to bring the global environmental community together in Stockholm ahead of uh, the World uh, Environmental Day, uh, which was uh, yesterday. And uh, in this uh, participation, which uh, the Prime Minister conveyed a message uh, through video, he highlighted the efforts that Ethiopia has been undertaking in the past three years in doing its share uh, for building a healthy environment by planting um, around 18 billion seedlings as part of the Green uh, Legacy Initiative. So as we all know, a lot of developing countries, particularly Ethiopia, are also afflicted by uh, climate change, which they don't necessarily contribute uh, uh, much towards, uh, yet uh, the initiatives that are being uh, uh, undertaken and progressing uh, on the Ethiopian side is to circumvent and uh, taking on adaptive and mitigation measures beyond um, our contribution to uh, climate change. Um, yesterday, on June 5th, uh, we marked the National Police Day organized by Ethiopian uh, Federal Police, where the Prime Minister was also in attendance to honor the sacrifice of um, members of the Federal Police uh, that had participated in the National uh, Rule of Law campaign in the northern part of the, the country. Um, you would note in his remarks that he highlighted the length to which um, the country and the government is going to build a well-structured, a well-equipped uh, security sector institutions that are prof uh, professionally 
um, led in service of the nation. So yesterday's police parade is a partial demonstration of security sector reforms that have been, um, uh, you know, taking place over the last two years, and that have been uh, obviously accelerated, particularly. Um, uh, following the confrontation in the north. So reforming the security process or the security sector process is, uh, is a process in of itself uh, and it need not be construed as complete package but um, this is uh, a promise that had been made uh, when the Prime Minister came into the Premiership to ensure that there's uh, an overhaul and uh, a reformation that's, uh, undertake, that's being undertaken within um, the security sector and yesterday's um, uh, key point to be articulated in that sense is to what extent the federal police is also uh, reforming itself and equipping itself uh, to cater to the challenges uh, and the needs that the country is faced with. Um, continuing to the second point, I want to bring to your attention that we are in the green legacy uh, season, uh, which is upon us. Uh, this year, we mark the final year of the four-year um, green legacy challenge, uh, which was uh, embarked upon in 2019 to plant 20 billion seedlings. Um, as uh, initiated by the Prime Minister to address various environmental challenges by promoting a green culture, this year's Green Legacy season will be launched within uh, the next two weeks. Uh, when we say final year, this does not mean it's the end of uh, Ethiopia's greening uh, journey, but it highlights that a milestone um, has been achieved in keeping our four-year commitment to build uh, 20 billion seedlings. In this case, we will be um, exceeding the set target because over the past three years already, uh, the data is showing that uh, around 18 billion seedlings had been planted. So as you well know, the Green Legacy in Initiative includes uh, planting edible um, seedling varieties. So this uh, initiative in tandem with the urban agriculture and backyard farming efforts being promoted aim to partially address food security uh, needs amidst a uh, global um, rise in food costs as well. I want to move on to uh, humanitarian response updates overall, um, uh, which is a third point of today's briefing. As we know, the Horn of Africa continues to be affected by um, climate change-induced drought, and um, hence why one of this administration's uh, mid- to long-term uh, emphasis has been on the Green Legacy Initiative as a means of mitigating the consequences of uh, climate change. So even though we might not be seeing it within uh, you know, these uh, few years, uh, it has a long-term um, uh, perspective uh, and a generational perspective to counter the effects of climate change and the consequences of uh, climate change that are managed manifesting in Ethiopia as well as the Horn region. Uh, some parts of the country have unfortunately been experiencing uh, uh, dire droughts as a result of consecutive below average uh, rainfall uh, that has been afflict afflicting uh, the Horn region. At a policy level, Ethiopia has put in place uh, several uh, mechanisms, um, several policies and institu institutional measures uh, with mitigation and adaptive programs um, at the center of these um, endeavors. Um, additionally, through Ethiopia's homegrown economic reforms um, uh, program, uh, there has been an intensification, as you would note, of um, cluster farming and irrigation-based lowland wheat productivity, which um, has shown uh, considerable uh, success. Uh, but this is something to be built upon uh, as well in subsequent uh, uh, months and years ahead. Uh, at a response level for the needs uh, to drought-afflicted uh, communities in the immediate term, the government has uh, responded much early um, and intensified national efforts to enhance the effectiveness of disaster risk management. Um, per recent data received from the National Disaster Risk Management Commission, between July 2021 and uh, May 2022, uh, around 3.2 million beneficiaries have received food assistance um, brought on or for um, uh, disasters brought on uh, by, uh, by nature or as a natural consequence and uh, these beneficiaries um, are mostly in Oromia, uh, Somali region and uh, the southern uh, nation nationalities uh, region. Moving on to the fourth uh, part, again as an extension of uh, humanitarian assistance that is uh, being provided, particularly in the northern part of the country. As it pertains to uh, humanitarian assistance through the government of Ethiopia's declaration of uh, indefinite humanitarian truce, you would note that the supply of humanitarian assistance uh, in the Tigray region uh, continues uh, to progress. To break it down for you a little bit, as of uh, June 3, the data that I have uh, from the National Disaster Risk Management Commission. Um, 
So this is for a period covering July 2021 to June uh, 3, 2022. The cash transferred to uh, the Tigray region totals 2.1 billion bir for humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, medicine dispatched, uh, the data that I have is above uh, 217,000 uh, kgs. For non-food uh, items, which include um, uh, various shelters and other uh, protection items, the data that I have is um, 130,000 kilograms worth of non-food supplies. And then for food supplied, I have a data which indicates um, above 87,000 metric tons of food that has um, made its way and entered the Tigray region. When it comes to fuel, uh, above 783,000 um, liters of fuel um, is, uh, is, uh, has been facilitated to enter the Tigray region within the, this period as well. Um, when it comes to quantifying how many trucks have reached, because part of the um, the back and forth has been on amount of trucks that need to go in uh, to safely uh, provide for beneficiaries in there. Uh, 1,306, particularly in the months of April and May 2022, we have 1,306 trucks that have um, arrived uh, within the Tigray region as well. And uh, this does not include, obviously, humanitarian assistance flights that are also carrying uh, various assistance to the region. In the Afar region, I have um, data that indicates that uh, about 19,000 metric tons of food has been dispatched for beneficiaries uh, within the region. Uh, the Amhara region, again, as a consequence of displacement or conflict-related displacement, we have around um, to above 244,000 metric tons of food um, that has also been dispatched uh, for various communities in that uh, region. So there is a further breakdown that uh, at a later point in time that could, I could also share with you in uh, on paper as well. So this is just to indicate to you that the government of Ethiopia has continued its commitment to expedite the supply of food and humanitarian assistance uh, to reach the Tigray region. Um, the misconception, I, I imagine, is starting to dissipate because uh, there has been a concerted effort um, since the declaration of the humanitarian truce. Uh, so this uh, misconception that the government of Ethiopia is obstructing um, humanitarian assistance continues um, unabated, however. Um, in this regard, the international community is also uh, encouraged to intensify its effort to meet humanitarian needs in Ethiopia, including for the Tigray regional state. Again, we have to also look at um, what I mentioned earlier as a, uh, there's uh, humanitarian needs that are growing as a result of natural disasters um, um, also. Um, however, I mean, within the past, uh, could say about four weeks or so, we have seen uh, a rhetoric of um, gearing up for another confrontation from the other side. Um, this, you know, preparation for another offense, unfortunately, is coming um, in alignment with the farming season. And uh, it's important to highlight here that the Tigray region would be if TPLF is um, amping up the war drums again, as it has been doing over the past few weeks. Uh, this is going to be at the expense of citizens, uh, uh, you know, within the Tigray region and farming communities who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, who have missed around in that, and then due to the conflict uh, in the past uh, uh, year and a half, uh, have missed farming seasons as well. So this instigation of violence, again, would really uh, tremendously affect uh, the farming cycle within the region as well. Um, we have also data that has been emerging, and I'm sure you have seen as well that uh, the TPLF continues to forcefully conscript uh, people into its forces. And, uh, you know, the belligerent atrocities, again, would be, um, you know, really detrimental uh, to the region. So on the part of the Ethiopian government, uh, the commitment to peace has always been there, the commitment to supporting on humanitarian assistance, ensuring um, that humanitarian assistance makes its way to the region, um, although it needs Needs to be verified uh, f uh, on, uh, from other parties to what extent the intended beneficiaries are getting this humanitarian assistance. So with these couple of um, items, let me open it up to questions that you may have and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Belene, for the explanation. Two questions on the issue in the north. Um, we have seen on pictures, uh, even with the Prime Minister, former President uh, Oli Senghor Basenjo, and we've seen him in Megali as well. What is the, the take from the government uh, when it comes to the efforts being exerted by the African Union in brokering peace? Uh, two, 
in Amhara region, there are also people who are in need of humanitarian assistance uh, at the moment, and also in, in, in Oromia because of um, the activities uh, of the Oromo Liberation Army, there are people who are said to be evicted from their homes. Um, what is being done to address these people now that the rainy season is here as part of the humanitarian uh, effort that you're exerting? Thank you. As it uh, relates to the question that you asked in terms of what is the government's take for the AU-led process, this is something that the Ethiopian government has uh, welcomed from the get-go, has been supporting of. Uh, there is a high regard for His Excellency uh, President, uh, former President Olusogun Abasanjo. Indeed, he was here uh, with the Prime Minister uh, reviewing uh, development, uh, current development projects in the Oromia region, as well as potential development projects as well. Um, so whether he has been seen or not on the other end, I don't know what the discussions would have been on the other end. Nevertheless, um, the posture of the Ethiopian government still is uh, a posture of uh, wanting peace, uh, wanting the normalization uh, of you know people's lives that have been disrupted as a result of, um, of uh, this uh, conflict. Um, so facilitating this process, as you know, any kind of peace process is long. Um, it has... Um, uh, it's not uh, simple, it's a complex process. It has multi-layers as well. So at this point, the Ethiopian government uh, is uh, uh, engaging uh, with the full commitment uh, for peace uh, to come about, is engaging with uh, the AU-led process. So that's as much as that I could say in that regard. Uh, the fruits of that will uh, bear uh, in due time and uh, we will be able to share what that means uh, when it, uh, when it uh, manifests. The Amhara region uh, humanitarian assistance, this is something that I had also covered earlier. So um, again, attention needs to be focused on that. We have uh, over the past months, uh, even in briefings with you, uh, we have uh, been highlighting that it's important to ensure that the, the attention for humanitarian assistance is not taken off from people that have whose lives have been uprooted as a part of TPLF's belligerence in the Amhara and Afar regions. The Ethiopian government um, and partners are engaged in delivering humanitarian assistance to uh, conflict-affected communities. Um, I've just given you a brief summary of the amount of food supplies and non-food supplies that have gone into the region, but uh, detailed uh, after the briefing would be happy to provide you with um, the detailed numbers on that. Nevertheless, um, Overall, when we're looking at the, the humanitarian assistance, there still needs to be an increase um, from partners. Uh, we understand that there's other parts of the country, I mean, other parts of uh, the world and other parts of the region that are also in dire need of humanitarian assistance uh, brought by um, uh, natural disasters, as earlier explained. But uh, nevertheless, these regions, um, as part of the government is concerned, the, there are efforts to ensure that uh, assistance reaches there. But again, this is also uh, a call out to you know international partners to also increase uh, the level of support uh, for these regions as well as uh, the other regions that are affected uh, as well. The TPLF and the Eritrean government are blaming one another of uh, provoking war these days. So what is the uh, Ethiopian government stake right now in this regard? I can't speak on behalf of both parties, so I don't have any uh, definite information as it relates to that. So I think it's important to pass uh, that. And if there's any further information that comes particularly from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs side, I'll be happy to share it with you. But I don't have any further information. No way. Then. Thank you for the briefing. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister said that uh, banned equipment was transported to Tigray recently. Can we have a bit more detail on that? Um, and another question on Zimbabwe. Uh, recently, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, declared that they were ready to extradite uh, Mengis to Aile Mariam. Uh, did the Ethiopian government make any request in that sense? Okay. On banned equipment, no way. Um, this is, I think, an outcome of uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's recent visit. Uh, to the Afar region. So I would defer to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to give you more details on that. Again, for your second question as well, I defer to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because this is a, a, a matter under their purview. Abilene, uh, thanks for the briefing. Um, just two short questions. One, on the issue of the humanitarian assistance going into the Tigray region. Has the government 
opened up the access enough because I, I, I believe the government is still getting accusations that uh, it has not opened up enough for more to go into the Tigray region. I mean, what's the status of the government on that in terms of access? Then secondly, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has raised concern about arrest of journalists, especially local journalists, um, saying that probably those who have been arrested should be brought to court. There's a delay in that. I don't know. Does that kind of dent the Prime Minister's image that already came out as a government that allows freedom of speech? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Coletta. I mean, I don't think I have anything more to add on part of the humanitarian assistance because I did um, already share um, uh, the kind of the perspective that is uh, out there versus what is being done on the part of the the government. Um, you would note that there's certain uh, number, there's certain figures that have been floating in terms of uh, the required need uh, within the region. As far as the Ethiopian government and the data that I have from the National Disaster Risk Management Commission, it shows that anywhere between between 100 to um, 200 trucks um, are entering uh, per, per week or uh, yeah per week uh, within the region I will have to verify that for you but uh, there is a lot of effort and a lot of goodwill to facilitate um, uh, the humanitarian assistance to that region but the question again that I leave for you is is humanitarian assistance le reaching the intended beneficiaries as well because on the part of the Ethiopian government I think there's a lot of agencies also that are testifying to the fact that um, this is uh, there's a much more movement um, as it relates to assistance your second question of journalists um, or the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission um, statement um, the, it's it's important to to note that um, there are laws that have come as a result of uh, the reforms. The media landscape and the media um, uh, space has really opened up. We cannot deny that um, because it's always uh, important to look at what has had been before and the goodwill um, and uh, the responsibility that the current administration has taken in terms of opening up uh, the media space. So part of the reforms uh, that came about is the media law and um, the exercise of freedom of speech. Um, the extent of the exercise of freedom of speech is something that you can monitor in you know in various uh, scenarios as well. So there is that practice, a democratic practice that is coming as part of uh, a culture that is facilitating uh, open space in terms of media. At the same time, we're also uh, particularly experiencing um, a time where there's uh, polarization along ethnic lines and along religious lines as well. So there's also rules and there are also laws that have been put in place in order to ensure that people are not affected as a result of that, hence the hate speech law as well and disinformation laws. Um, when we talk about journalists, I think it's really important to unpack who is a journalist and who is not because um, there's a lot of outcry that has been heard over the past few weeks in terms of journalists that have been arrested. But as far as the Ethiopian Media Authority, which is a regulatory body that licenses journalists, is aware um, many of these that are um, that are going under the banner of journalists are not uh, accredited or not licensed under the Media Authority. Yes, some of them may fall under. Um, online media. However, there are also online media that uh, the Ethiopian Media Authority has registered and is close contact with. So in order to follow up uh, those details, they would need to also come under that umbrella. Uh, the second part to also highlight in this is uh, when we talk about journalism, I think it's a respected profession. There are ethics that are that guide journalism. There are principles that guide journalism. So in if everybody with a YouTube channel is considered a journalist and there is no, um, you know, means of uh, regulating, uh, you know, what is said uh, to the extent that it is pushing along these ethnic and religious cl cleavages and creating uh, or fomenting, uh, you know, uh, cleavages along uh, societal lines and ethnic, uh, ethno-linguistic lines, then it's very um, uh, problematic. I think also as uh, media entities and media houses, it's important for you to um, explore you know, which uh, entities do fall under um, these strict definitions of, um, you know, journalistic uh, practices and, and so on. So I think it's better to um, respond to that in that manner. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my questions are somewhat related to what Kulit has raised. Uh, in, in, in addition to, you know, the, the said journalist who have seen uh, the mass arrest of individuals here in, here in Addis and, I mean, uh, here in Addis and in Amhara region uh, following uh, the launching of what uh, what the government has been calling a law enforcement enforcement oppression. So uh, we've seen thousands of people uh, jailed in a rather short period of time. 
and there have been concerns raised about these arrests as well. So are you concerned that these, these operations might, uh, you know, some of these individuals that are arrested uh, might see uh, their rights violated? Uh, and in, in, in some areas, we have also heard reports of uh, confrontations and deaths as well. Uh, so are you concerned that there might be some uh, civilians that might be caught in the, in the crossfire? Uh, this is also uh, the, the case in Oromia as well, because uh, prior to what happened in Amhara, we heard uh, the launching of another operation there, particularly against uh, the Oromo Liberation Army. And during that operation, we have heard uh, quite a number of reports uh, about and allegations about uh, civilian deaths. Some of them were, uh, you know, reported by some uh, um, uh, media outlets. So, are you concerned that these operations uh, might pose threats uh, to the sef the well-being and the safety of civilians? I think it's really important to understand that um, the safety and well-being of civilians um, in these particular regions that you've mentioned, as well as um, regions throughout the country, is the purpose of rule of law operations that are being administered by the government. Um, there are many cases within both regions, because these are operations that are being taken uh, by the regions themselves. But there are many instances in which um, uh, you know, civilians, at the, um, at the behest of uh, you know, um, illegal or um, illegal organizations and entities uh, that are not part of uh, security sector or government security sector are causing harm to civilians within these regions as well. So there is an outcry from uh, members of various communities within these two regions for the government to ensure rule of law. Ensuring the rule of law means there are certain measures that the government would have to take to ensure that um, individuals who are falling or operating outside you know, mandated security apparatuses and who um, may be, you know, proliferating small uh, arms, who may be proliferating various kind of um, arms within the regions, are uh, brought to, you know, or apprehended. Uh, because part of ensuring a rule of law and part of ensuring a peace and stability for civilians, as you mentioned it, is um, ensuring that there is clarity in terms of uh, where the monopoly of uh, violence or the monopoly of, a viol of uh, law rests. Uh, of power. Um, so th these uh, events that have been undertaken or these individuals that you say that have been apprehended are those that have been operating outside the legal lines. They have been uh, bro bringing a lot of um, a destruction to communities. They have been using, um, because we have to, we have to, you know, understand that particularly in the Amhara region, uh, it has you know, it is a post-war region in a way because it has been um, challenged by a TPLF's aggression and incursions. There has been uh, a buildup of arms as well, um, illegal arms that uh, has been also a conduit for a lot of illegal arms. So there are certain bodies uh, that are not um, acknowledged by the regional government that are operating outside of these uh, confines. Uh, so these operations are made to ensure that there are calls also falling into line. And from the information and the data that I have, disarmament has been underway. And in fact, over the past four weeks, the region has also been indicating that it has been successful in uh, uh, bringing a certain sense of uh, control to those outliers. So uh, part of that as well has been people or individuals that you've mentioned who have been instigating disinformation along ethnic lines, along uh, religious lines. The operating context that I share to you is uh, there is individuals that are um, enhancing or increasing the polarization of uh, certain areas along ethnic and religious lines. And this is not acceptable uh, because uh, the Ethiopia that this government is working for, the Ethiopia that uh, a lot of entities um, are working for, and as well as what citizens aspire for, is one uh, that is not divided uh, along uh, these um, uh, cleavages. So any individuals that are operating to further create cleavages have to be um, apprehended. So it is in that spirit that within the Amhara and uh, Oromia regions, these operations have been undertaken. Thank you very much and uh, we'll follow up with subsequent briefings if there's anything else.